perceive things happening around us. And that's what is important because it, it helps us to relate to our external environment. But everything that happens now is a result of what's happened before. There is an historical context, a temporal event continuum, bringing different strands and trajectories together to make today possible. There have been historical background to what's happening today. So that's something we'll talk about. Human cognition is limited and modest. Uh, neurobiologists and social psychologists have written hundreds of books on that subject. So what we understand is quite limited and modest. And once we accept that, that limitation of our ability to comprehend the complexity of the external environment, then it becomes somewhat easier for us to chase the reality, the real nature of reality. Uh, we talk about a little bit about China and United States relation because fundamentally, US-India collaboration, as I will demonstrate to you, historically began and continues as a response to perceived shared threats from China, or Communist China, or the People's Republic of China. And here uh, we have a sequence of events that happened, you can see, uh, that suggests to me that until the year 2000, things moved up and down several times. The United States and India worked closely together, then fell apart, then came back together in 2000, and I've never looked back since. Relationship have uh, really taken off. Now, as regards US-India-Pakistan relational dynamics, I rely on what the leaders of these countries have said about this relationship. It's useful because you can read dozens of documents, still you cannot get to the essence of what the elites, the rulers, the leaders of governments actually feel about their own country vis-a-vis -vis some other country. That's why these statements are quite important. And the first two statements are from Pakistan's and Indian leaders. The Pakistani Prime Minister at the United Nations General Assembly last September, and the next day the Indian Foreign Minister or Minister of External Affairs responding. If you look at the language, it is slightly less than diplomatic. Normal diplomatic linguistics would suggest that you are quite careful in what you say, but certainly the second statement suggests that there is a lot of anger there and not too much concern about diplomatic nicety. But this is not new. This is, I would suggest, this is ancient, fundamental, elemental, and even philosophical between India and Pakistan. And when we have question and answer, if you are interested, I can discuss my view of this. On the other hand, you can see what the US leaders and the Indian leaders talk about their relationship. So you have on the one hand Indian versus Pakistani perception of each other, and then you have Indian versus American perceptions of each other. This was not always the case, but this has been more or less the case for many decades now, except for a short period where things were different. So one says this will be a defining partnership. And although President Trump has fundamentally shifted from the domestic priorities of the Obama administration, insofar as external relations and policies are concerned, there is a lot of continuity. And you can see what the Secretary of State, Tillerson, has said about Pakistan and what the Secretary of State, Tillerson, has said about India. Very starkly contrasting perspectives. And this suggests that not so much that Americans are deeply uh, driven by animosity towards Pakistan, but that they are deeply driven by friendship towards or amity or cooperation or attraction towards India. It is not a zero-sum game for them that they, because they love India so they hate Pakistan, it isn't quite as simple or black and white like that. It isn't. The reality is quite complex, actually. Now, I want to talk about uh, the system model which I find very useful in my studies, and I propose to you that you might consider studying this as well. The international security system is one of many paradigms that geopoliticians have fashioned over the last many decades, 50 years now. At the heart of this is the core, which comprises the greatest of great powers, 
Now you might say, what is power then? We'll talk about that in the Q&A if you're interested, but I'm sure you all know what power is. Oh, thank you. But the heart of the international security system is the core which comprises the greatest of great powers or the superpowers. Around the core, during the Cold War, the core comprised a bipolar diarchy of the USSR and the USA. Adversarial bipolar system which balanced each other because of the thermonuclear uh, mad doctrine. Around the core is a dominant system comprising the other great powers. And around the dominant system are subordinate systems, which are, again, geographical entities rather than these are constructs. They don't physically exist except in the minds of geopoliticians because they are useful tools for analysis. Subordinate systems are divided into regional subsystems, which are much more interesting because these can be well-defined, articulated, and you can actually see them in action. South Asia is one of those. Southeast Asia is another. East Asia and so on. And then you, these uh, subordinate system and regional subsystems are part of the systemic periphery. So you have the periphery at the outer rim, and you have the core in the center, and the two are connected by what's called the intrusive system, which is really known in the diplomatic language as alliances. And the new phrase, relatively new phrase, called strategic <coughs> partnerships. So Pakistan is a non-NATO major ally of the United States. India is also a non-NATO major strategic partner of the United States, which means United States and Pakistan on the one hand, and the United States and India, on the other hand, share many security interests. And the views of one must necessarily travel onto the other to influence and shape and color the policies and activities of the other. So we have a lot of those intrusive systems connecting the central bipolarity to the periphery. And Pakistan-India subsystem comes into that. Now, very quickly, I would like to go back to a bit of history and demonstrate to you that U.S.-India relations have actually been very close in the security field from the 5th of July, 1947. Now, I don't have to tell you that this was five weeks before India and Pakistan actually became uh, dominions or independent states. But five weeks before then, India, or its uh, presumptive appointed, nominated prime minister, prime minister-designate, was on the executive board of the Viceroy's Council, authorized the United States Army Air Forces to operate from six then Indian air bases. And these are, these are Barakpur, Kharagpur in Bengal, and also Dam Dam near Calcutta. And then you had Agra, uh, and then you had Palam, only for night operations. And you had Santa Cruz, and also Maripur. Maripur, of course, uh, is spelled by the Americans as M-A-R-I. So I've kept the original spelling. Uh, as you know, became part of Pakistan on the 14th of August. And so in 1948, this first agreement, signed on the 5th of July, was revised and renewed to exclude Maripur. And then this was revised and renewed several times. Essentially, American Army Air Forces provided combat support and combat operations in support of Gomentang, Chiang Kai-shek's forces fighting uh, the Chinese Communist Party, Red Army, across southwestern China during the last stages of the Chinese Civil War. So India was quite openly engaged. On the only difference was that uh, Indians charged and were paid in full, all the costs. They were given exactly the same facility at these bases, the personnel and the aircraft for rearming, fueling, maintenance, servicing, repairing, exactly as what the Indian Air Force or the Royal Indian Air Force at that time received, except that the Americans paid for every service that they received. So it was paid service, but the facilities were given fully and wholeheartedly. This was not part of the openly discussed uh, Indian relationship with the USA. Very few people except those on the ground knew about it. Well, in 1950, as you know, the United States uh, published its NSC document. Uh, this is the key document. NSC 68 set out the parameters and the fundamentals of containment of communism as the organizing force of US foreign and national security policy. And everything that followed actually 
try to adhere to this particular document or the objectives there. And that is the same year, in addition to the outbreak of the Korean War, the Chinese Red Army crossed the Dree River into Tibet or Eastern Tibet, the two provinces of Amdo and Kham, and occupied it. Since 1912, a uh, year after uh, the Chinese Republican Revolution and the end of the Qing Dynasty, uh, Tibet had become pretty much independent. Although no country actually recognized Tibet as independent, it was effectively independent. And the Chinese Red Army tried to reverse that and occupy Tibet. And uh, a, a war broke out. And the Amdoa and the Kampa and the Golok, three mountain people, uh, guerrillas, militias, they started fighting. And the Indians and the Americans provided direct support. And Pakistan, Pakistan uh, Military Intelligence's Geo-Survey Unit, based in then East Pakistan, provided equally direct support for a number of years, from 1956 to 1962. Um, guerrillas were recruited, uh, came to Shiliguri, Kalimpong, came to Dinajpur, crossed the border into East Pakistan. They were taken to Dhaka, and they were put on aircraft at Tejgai Airport, and then taken to Chiang Mai, Guam, Saipan, and so on. So Pakistan was also engaged indirectly in supporting uh, the containment policy. But as you may remember, Pakistan was the most allied ally of the United States in those days. It had signed up to the Baghdad Pact or CENTO and the uh, uh, Manila Pact or CETO. India had not. It had just signed a number of bilateral agreements. And then in 1954, United, um, China and India signed an agreement recognizing Tibet as a province of China. But nonetheless, the guerrilla warfare continued. It became so effective that in 1957, Mao Zedong decided to postpone what he called the liberation of Tibet by five years, until 1962. And then, of course, this, this continues. You can see uh, from guerrilla operation and proxy warfare, it became a border dispute. But one really gelled into the other. Uh, Zhou Enlai wrote a number of uh, letters, diplomatic, uh, documents to Nehru, visited India three times, um, and the Indians basically uh, demanded return of what they called Indian territory. Uh, so there was a completely uh, a dialogue of the deaf between China and India on the territory. Uh, China also complained that uh, Tibetan guerrillas, resistance, as they called them bandits, were crossing the border into India or were operating from Indian sanctuary into Tibet and uh, trying to attack the uh, duly constituted authority in Tibet, uh, India denied all charges. And then, of course, the war began, as you know, it lasted one month. On the 19th of November, it became so desperate that Nehru sent two telegrams to President Kennedy, really requesting several squadrons of fighter aircraft uh, and bomber aircraft as well, as well as a radar network to protect the Himalayan boundaries from Chinese attack, because the fear was the Chinese would come down uh, into the valleys and essentially take over the Gangetic Plain. But the tw on the 20th, the Chinese unilaterally declared a ceasefire and went back uh, to the border as they held uh, a month ago. Since then, that particular defeat really created um, a cathartic experience for the Indian national elite. It has never left them. Uh, China then became Instead of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, since that defeat, uh, China became the real strategic concern for the Indian leadership, around which they organized the national, national security narrative. Pakistan was not uh, the primary strategic concern for India. Pakistan was the primary tactical and operational concern, but not the strategic concern. So if you can see that distinction, then you will see that there is a hierarchy of Indian concern, and the reason uh, India goes back to the United States repeatedly is not because it is concerned so much about Pakistan. It is concerned primarily with China. And to counter that insecurity vis-a-vis -vis China, it needs, it feels, uh, American help. And uh, if I may suggest that, the United States does exactly the same. Historically, from the 19, late 1940s, the 1950s, 1960s, Except for the 1970s and 1980s, those two decades were lost to U.S.-India strategic collaboration. 
because the United States decided the Soviet Union was a much bigger threat and China was the countervailing force that could strengthen America's hand and also end the Indochina war and bring the boys home with honor is the phrase Nixon repeatedly used that they approached China. While Nixon approached China, remarkably, China also approached America. And who played the intermediary? Not France, as Kissinger first tried and failed. Not Romania, they also tried and failed. Not Poland. They did not try, but they were there when the first discussion took place. It didn't work. But Pakistan did. Pakistan's president, uh, General Aga Muhammad Yahya Khan, proved to be the most credible intermediary, carrying messages back and forth, and Sultan Ahmed Khan, the foreign secretary. These two men, uh, primarily, ran the Pakistani end of the show. Um, but of course, I just wanted to show a little bit of history as well. There was a lot of collaboration between the CIA and the Intelligence Bureau against China. And uh, you can see. Um, and then of course, at the end of the Cold War, things changed all over again because the Soviet Union ceased to exist at the end of 1991. Uh, India had to find new avenues of support. India was very insecure. And it was economically in a quite a difficult situation. And that's why the economic reforms uh, initiated by then Finance Minister Manmohan Singh transformed the Indian economy to what we see today, a rapidly growing, industrializing country. Um, in 1993, 92-93, the system suddenly became unipolar. The bipolarity was gone. and. That's when the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee and the Central Military Commission organized a two-week seminar at which a number of papers were read by specialists. And they looked ahead to about 20, 25 years uh, insofar as China's strategic interests were concerned. And they determined that it would be the United States with Japanese and Republic of Korean support that would pose the gravest threat um, to China's security. And China then prepared itself accordingly. That was 93. It was 1999, so six years later, in the summer study, uh, the Department of Defense in Washington has what they call an Office of Net Assessment, ONA. It was headed by Andrew Marshall uh, at the behest of the Secretary of Defense Schlesinger in 1973. It is the Department of Defense's own think tank, and it looks approximately 30 years ahead to see where the world would be, uh, where America needed to be to ensure America's primacy, systemic primacy. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, the United States was quite determined to extend its systemic primacy or domin domination, if you like, indefinitely. And that became the fundamental goal of the United States defense and national security policy. It is not something you may like or it's not something you may dislike, but the, this is the reality. So since then, the United States has done two things. One, it has identified China as the only country in the near future that could prevent America's force projection across the Asia Pacific and across the Eurasian landmass. So therefore, China was the most uh, potential near peer rival that had to be contained. This was never spelled out in a policy document, but if you look at RAND China policy documents, it becomes very clear. They also, uh, sort of every four years, the Pentagon reports uh, on national security policies, and you, those policies make it very clear as well. Um, in 1999, a number of things happened. The Americans bombed Beijing's Belgrade embassy, they say by mistake. Uh, Chinese didn't believe that. And a number of other things happened with the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the defense budget uh, authorized by the Congress. The DOD sends it to the Congress, and the Congress then adds a lot of stuff. The House of Representatives, the Senate reconcile, and then eventually it is passed in a vote. It goes to the president for signature. Before it goes to the president for signature, the Congress added four provisions. One, cut all contacts with the PLA. That's number one. Second establish an institute for the study of Chinese military affairs at the National Defense University in Washington. Three, set up the United States uh, Commerce and Security Review Commission, 
which will study uh, economic and military relationship vis-a-vis -vis the PLA, issue annual report. And finally, the DIA, the D Defense Intelligence Agency, which in the 1980s published an annual report on Soviet military forces for informing the American public as well as the American establishment, should now be issuing an annual report on the PLA, essentially placing China at roughly the same level of animosity or concern as the Soviet Union was. And then, of course, in 1998, India and Pakistan went nuclear, and that changed the uh, regional landscape quite a bit. <coughs> Initially, in 1998, uh, I think in the summer, July, President Clinton visited Beijing and with uh, counterpart Jiang Zemin signed an unprecedented joint statement about South Asia, focusing on the nuclear dangers from India and Pakistan becoming nuclear weapon state. And of course, the Indians were extremely upset about this. They didn't wish uh, the United States with China to dictate the discourse on uh, Indian security. But also, and this is the interesting bit, uh, in May 1998, shortly after the nuclear test, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee wrote to President Clinton explaining the drivers behind the Indian tests. And he explained that it was China and Pakistan whose threat individually and bilaterally, mutually, that had forced India to do this. Uh, to go nuclear. And then, of course, if you know, um, India and the United States engaged in a long set of series of meetings uh, with Jaswan Singh, who was the vice chairman of the Planning Commission, later became uh, Secretary of Minister of Defense, the Minister of Finance, and Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State. They met a number of times in different countries, talked about India signing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. India did not. But nonetheless, the discussion they held talked at length about the fundamental insecurity elements driving both America and India. And the consensus was that for both India and the United States, the primary concern was China. So that's where the convergence became quite clear. And thereafter, a number of things happened. Uh, I've talked about this. So as India becomes closer to the United States, Pakistan became closer to China. So there is this dialectic, active, reactive polarization in the subcontinent. So it is not just that the United States is close to India and that creates problem for Pakistan. It does. But there is also the other side that Pakistan also became close to China. And that also causes anxiety in India and the USA. So there is this dialectic process. And I'm not sure you might be in a better position to advise me whether this cycle can be broken. Um, it may be. It may not be amenable to diplomatic solution. But at the moment, this is the dynamic that is driving uh, insecurity across the region. And how did the USA propose to uh, reinforce uh, ties uh, to India? with these four agreements. Uh, they've been trying since the George Bush 43rd president's administration came to office. And they managed to sign one in 2002, which is the General Security of Military Information Agreement, which obliges each partner to s ensure the security of classified information provided to it by the other side. So USA gives a lot of stuff to India. India is obliged to protect its security. Similarly, vice versa. That's one. That they signed quite as a sort of early on. Last year, they signed the logistic base exchange facilities agreement, um, logistic exchange memorandum of agreement signed last year. But the other two, which would really allow American and Indian aircraft and vessels, surface and subsurface vessels, to engage targets designated by the other side essentially make them a single force like NATO forces, that hasn't happened yet. So something as an indicator, we need to watch how deeply they move in that direction. And the communication information security, again, operational and drill coordination of fleets and flotillas. So if they move towards those, then uh, we, are, we are there. Then we really have to worry. Um, 
I'll say that uh, there's a lot of convergence politically, diplomatically, strategically, and militarily. And we can see uh, what happened last year. Um, last year was the last uh, of a seven year period in which India became one of the largest purchasers of United States military equipment, $16.9 billion. Uh, this, is, this is dramatic. And they have started sharing intelligence, started joint development, joint R&D, and they are soon about to start joint production as well. And I, I would suggest to you, particularly my naval friends, uh, to keep an eye on the email system. It's the most developed, advanced electromagnetic aircraft launch system from the aircraft carrier. The latest, the Ford class. The first of the class, Ford, has emails. Now, President Trump was very unhappy with it. He tried to shut it down. But the Navy is much bigger than Trump. And I, I think uh, future uh, super carriers of the Ford class will have emails. And now the Americans have offered it to India. I don't know if they've offered it to anybody else, but they've offered it to India. And I think the next aircraft carrier that India is building already uh, will probably be equipped with emails. Now, that level of integration, that level of exchange of sophisticated technology with each other, uh, say something about collaboration. And now a few leadership statements, and I'll shut up. If you look at Belt and Road Initiative, you will appreciate that this is the fundamental strategic design that China has brought to bear on the system in many, many decades. This is a geoeconomic proposal. The proposition, as you know, has a big role to be played by Pakistan in the CPEC, but there is much more to it than CPEC. CPEC is a leading element, but there's more. And this is what he said to his own diplomats, essentially an economic diplomatic venture addressed or directed to China's relationship with its neighbors, its terrestrial and maritime neighbors, with a view to developing mutual, mutually beneficial economic relationship. This is what he said. And Pakistan's uh, former prime minister said this. And his Indian counterpart, on the other hand, had this to say, and I, I'm going to read this to you. He says, we appreciate the compelling logic of regional connectivity for peace, progress, and prosperity, very positive. However, connectivity itself cannot override or undermine the sovereignty of other nations. Essentially, Mr. Modi is saying that BRI, uh, CPEC, specifically, violates Indian sovereignty. Now, that is as serious a challenge as it can get from one country to another. So CPEC is considered to be a breach, a material breach of Indian sovereignty. He's talking about Gilgit Baltistan, of course. This is known. But this is also interesting because shortly after all the statement, the Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, had something to say to the US Congress on CPEC. He said, overall, it goes to a disputed territory. Again, talking about Gilgit Baltistan. And I think that in itself shows the vulnerability that China and Pakistan are trying to dictate what one belt, one road should mean. And they're questioning Americans, just like Indians, are questioning the legitimacy of certain aspects of OBOR and CPEC. So that sort of, I think, suggests to us that there is a serious convergence in US and Indian perspective on China-US relationship. It is not just US-India versus Pakistan. It's US, India versus China and Pakistan. That would be my reading of it. And I'm very happy to debate that point with uh, my colleagues here. Now, I just brought again uh, a couple of, actually four of these um, statements. Uh, President Barack Obama, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Indian National Security Advisor, retired now Shiv Shankar Menon, saying that China is fundamental to uh, Indian diplomacy. Every single state policy pursued and conducted by India has China relation at some stage or other. So India is really focused on China. And that is my point. India is not that much focused on Pakistan. So Pakistan has some gift, some leeway to manage, some diplomatic space, uh, because India is truly focused on China in the first instance. Secretary Tillerson, having talked about Pakistan in so many words, now says, the emerging Delhi-Washington strategic partnership stands upon a shared commitment upholding the rule of law, freedom of navigation, 
universal values and free trade. And the key phrase I put here is, we share a vision of the future. So that's a vision India shares with the USA. And it's something that my Pakistani colleagues and friends might find very interesting. And uh, so I will now come to an end of this presentation. And I'd like to say that the United States is building tacit alliance with India to counterbalance China in the first instance. So Pakistan is not the first objective of that coalition. The target is not Pakistan per se, but the implications for Pakistan are quite severe. The Pakistan is not the target, but nonetheless, it has to engage with this process, be aware of it. It's sufficient. A state needs much more than that. It must have defense and deterrence, but it also must have much more. And it is only together, all the elements making up the state's capacity, that you can look for uh, a positive future. And I have sort of made my point that I wish to make here. Um, there is a systemic transitional fluidity. Uh, the unipolar world is gone, but we don't have a bipolar world yet. We don't know what's coming. We do know it's changing. And in this period of transition, system, subsystem, everything is changing. Not just Pakistan. Most countries concerned with these things are facing a period of uncertainty, unpredictability, and everybody's hedging, balancing, trying to protect and defend their own interests. Because everybody's so anxious and trying to hedge and balance and protect their own interests, there's a lot of fluidity in the system. That's what I would suggest. And it is in this period of fluidity that dangers lurk, because you don't know the signal that you're getting whether what you think the signal means actually is what the signal being sent out by the other party. And just like that, the signals you send to the other party may be interpreted, misconstrued, misunderstood, and cause very strange and surprising responses that you're not expecting. So this is a period of grave uncertainty. You need, I mean, any state needs consolidation, coherence, internal strength and unity. And I would suggest to you, that's all I've got to say today. And at this point, all I can say more is thank you very much indeed for your time and your attention. Thank you. Um, the floor is open for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. China, of course. And, but even if Pakistan is not the target, Pakistan is in the way. So we need to really understand. And I think I won't be over-exaggerating if I state that Pakistan of today has the role of a catalyst in the global transitioning of power between the United States and America. It is therefore a very important subject to understand. And I'm sure today, sir, after this lecture, we are much more enlightened on this. And I'm once again grateful to you for having spared your time and having shared your thoughts with us. Now, for a small token of thanks and remembrance that you were here with us. <laughs>